Good afternoon, and I count myself privileged to be with you this afternoon. It's a privilege to share the Word of God with you. When we talk about this subject of the family, I do not claim to be the one who uh, knows uh, more than you about it. Many of you have been listening to tapes and conferences and, and uh, reading books about the family, and I'm sure, and as the Apostle Peter says, uh, I, uh, stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance to remind ourselves of what the Scripture says about the family and encourage one another that we may apply these things to our lives. And when we talk about this, and I'm sure the, the Word of God would expose our shortcoming for all of us, speaker and listeners, and we could say we have failed as we are subject to the Word of God. But uh, the grace of God is available. You know, I'm all often reminded of when the Lord speaks to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 18, I believe, and he says the vessel was marred in the hand of the potter. What does he do? doesn't throw it away and says there is no hope. Just get another vessel. But he takes the same clay and he makes of the clay another vessel as it seemed good in the hand for the mind and the sight of the potter. So we pray as the word of God exposes some of the areas where we have failed and it shows us the way that he is able to take the same clay and make a vessel as it seems good in the eyes of the potter. He is the one that can make out of you and out of me a vessel for his honor and glory. I tried to put some of the the uh, items that we are going to talk about, and I'm not sure if we're going to cover them all. We'll see how good are we in doing our homework. I wrote here six subjects that we're going to talk about. First, the home, home in general. And before we speak about the role of every member in the family, we're going to speak about the home, the Christian home. And on who or on what is the Christian home being established? We heard many things about the Christian family, and as I said, many of us have read, but the main thrust is to apply this to our hearts, to ourselves, not just to hear. So how is this home being founded? is established, how would it go on? And then the second thing we're going to talk about is marriage. Marriage is an honorable estate. And we're going to go back to the original marriage. <clears throat> Often when the Lord would ask, was asked the question, and even the Apostle Paul, when he dealt with a subject, he took it from the original from where it started. We're going to look at the marriage from where it started. We're going to go back to the book of the beginning, to the book of Genesis. And then we take the role of each member in the family, and the most important part is the wife and the husband. And because in all times when the scripture speaks about husband and wife, he begins with the wife. I guess that's where we got ladies first. So we're going to begin with the wives and then husbands and then both of them as parents to their children and then the role of the children. And each one of those is vital in the life and in the component 
of a Christian home. And we stress the fact that we're going to talk about Christian home. It's not any home. And before any one of us, anyone here, would like to know his role or her role in the family, we'd like you to be sure that you have life, that you have uh, trusted the Lord as a Savior. You know, one that is not a believer has absolutely no strength, no power to live a Christian life. One is born in this world with two certificates, a birth certificate and a death certificate. Anyone born in this world is born as a dead person. We were dead in trespasses and sins. We're not able to produce anything to God. And we would see how we should implant the word of God in the minds and in the hearts of the younger ones. However, it is God that makes the change. It is God that makes one to be a Christian. And without having the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have absolutely no power, no energy to live as a Christian in a Christian home. So we ask you, first of all, if you have not taken the Lord as your Savior, the first thing you would do is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we'd like to get the help of some of the young people, younger people, to read the scriptures. Anyone younger than me is a younger person. <laughs> That's what we do actually in, uh, in Willowdale. In the, if I can do that, if any young man can uh, read this. You don't have to read the, the whole uh, part of this. We will read Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 to 9, and maybe the first verse in Psalm 127, and the, these two verses in Psalm 128, just to make it simple. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Thank you. Psalm 127, verse 1. And then verses 3 and 4 from Psalm 128. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the side of thy house. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. Thank you. We want to see the foundation of the Christian home. How is it founded and on whom it is founded? The Lord said in Matthew 27, in the Sermon on the Mount, He said, Whosoever heareth these sayings and uh, doeth them is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. Actually, 
King James says on a rock, but it should say on the rock. It's a wise man who hears the word of the Lord and doeth them. He builds his house on the rock. So the foundation of the house of a wise man is on the rock, is on the Lord Jesus Christ. You ask someone, perhaps who is contemplating marriage, what are you going to found your, your home on? He would say, I will found it perhaps on happiness or in peace or in cooperation between me and my wife. But that wouldn't work. The only person you can found your home on is on the Lord Jesus Christ. The wise man built his house upon the rock. If you found it on any other thing, what happens when the rain comes down and when the flood comes and when the wind blows? That house is going to collapse. It's going to fall in no time unless it is founded on the Lord Jesus Christ. Unless the Lord builds the house, they shall labor in vain. And what does it mean to found the house and the home on the Lord Jesus Christ? The Lord says to Moses in the verses that we have read in Deuteronomy, these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. It is not um, in the ears of the Israelites, but first of all, he says, I command you. The Lord is not pleading with you. When the Lord speaks, he commands. And the only thing we can do is to listen. It is the Lord. He is the one that speaks, and he is the one that commands. And he says, let these words be in your heart. And actually, this is the characteristic of the book of Deuteronomy. It is Jehovah's words in the heart of Israel. And let this be our portion, that God's word would be <clears throat> in our hearts, would have the authority and the power. You know, God's word has the power to transform it is not any word. The word of God is quick and operative and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's dividing asunder between soul and spirit, between the joint and the marrow, and is a discerner of the heart and its intent. It's how powerful this word is. It transforms a person. It gives you and gives me life. And it is a sharp sword that divides between the soul and the spirit. These two we can confound sometimes. But the word of God divides them. That's how sharp it is. What's the difference between the soul and the spirit? The soul is the outward appearance. It is the, the emotions. It is what I like and what I don't like. Uh, it is the outward form, but the spirit is the inside, is the conscience, is the motives, and the word of God discerns and divides them apart. And it divides also <clears throat> the joint and the marrow. There are some doctors here, they can tell it better than I. The joint without the marrow is useless. It looks like a joint but it does not move. <clears throat> the marrow is the essence of the joint, and the word of God divides them asunder. It shows <clears throat> the heart and its intent. Every scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. That's how powerful the word of God, the man of God, would be perfect, nothing lacking. 
And Mr. McIntosh says that perfect, that word, means an, um, a machine with all its part, an instrument with all its strings, a body with all its limbs. There is nothing lacking. That is how powerful the Word of God is. And that is what it could do in the life of you and me. Otherwise, you hear some nice words. And you long to, uh, to be in the picture, as the scripture says, to the wives, to the husband, to the children, to the parents. But without the power of God, <clears throat> without the power of the word of God, you and I are helpless. We would be falling once and again. Before we get up, we fall down. And the only way to keep the word of God is to have it in our hearts. Is to apply it to ourselves. Is not just to hear a nice ceremony and then long to do it, but to keep it. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. And all over this study that we're going to have, it will be based on the power of the word of God in our hearts. The, the wife would have no energy to, be, to submit to her husband unless she owns the Lord as her Lord. When the scripture says, let the wife reverence her husband, how would she do that? Unless she, in the first place, has the fear of God in her heart. When it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the assembly. Unless he knows Christ, and unless he owns him as Lord, he wouldn't be able to do that. And then the next thing he says, you keep it in your heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently to your children. Now, in order for me to teach my, til my children diligently the word of God, first of all, I have to know it. You know, any instructor has to be instructed in what he says. Anyone not only has to be instructed, but uh, he has to apply it for himself. It is in vain to instruct my children to do this and that and the other if I do not show a guide and leadership in my life that I, I obey the word of God. We're going to talk about Moses in the, later on and how he um, decided that they would go out of Egypt with their young and with their old, with our children and with our daughters. And it would be in vain to take them out and try to teach them the lessons of the wilderness and later on of Canaan, but I myself am living in Egypt. I'm not saying this literally, because we all lift up Egypt. But I'm living in the world, and I'm enjoying it to every bit. And yet I tell my children, you have to live according to the lessons of God in the wilderness and to the inheritance in Canaan. I have to present to them, literally, the, um, the work of God in my heart. If we read these words as we have read in Deuteronomy 6, how much do we apply, verse 7, in our, in our family, around the table, when he says, you speak it to your children, and uh, you speak of it while you get up and while you lay down, and uh, when thou liest down and when thou risest up. How much of this talk goes on around the table with our children. One of the writers, and he is a, a great one whom we uh, esteem very highly, 
he said how much of a corrupt sometimes conversation go between us in the family. We speak about others, about other brethren, about some others whom we don't like. And uh, does this comply with uh, Deuteronomy 6, 7? Or then, when he says, And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. And this could be applied literally. Put them on the wall. Put the word of God on the walls. You know, a father went to visit his son who established a new home. And he went around all the house and admired the nice furniture and the good-sized homes. And then he told him, son, but uh, when someone walks in here, how would he know that this is a house that belonged to the Lord? And the son got the message, and next day he put some verses on the walls. But this is nice. Well, we ought to put it in our walk, practically. And then he says, on thy gates, outside, the passerby would realize, and the neighbors would realize that this is a Christian home. It belongs to the Lord. One of the missionaries sent a letter to the assembly he came from, and he said, I wish that some of you would bring their homes, their their families, and just live among those heathen. Show them how Christians live. How do they Deal with one another. If you can send us, for instance, a dentist or a, or a doctor, he doesn't have to preach, but just to show those people how Christians deal with one another. And put it on the gates. Let others see how the Christian family live. If we go to the Psalms that we read, Psalm 127 and verse 1 is a beautiful beginning of the psalm. Unless the Lord build a house, they shall labor in vain that build it. It is the Lord that builds a house. He is also the foundation of the house. And if everything goes around the Lord, then there could be no failure. There could be no um, these awful discussions that could go on in the homes. But rather, we would realize, sometimes we, would, we used to put uh, a frame, Christ is the head of this house, the unseen guest at every meal, and uh, the silent listener to every conversation. If that is the case, if we consider this in our hearts, that he listens to every conversation. Does he like what he hears among ourselves? And then Psalm 128. In this psalm, we see beautiful words on the wife and on the children. These two verses that our brother read, Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine in the corners of your house. A fruitful vine. What characterizes the vine? The vine gets the wine. And the wine speaks of joy. And here is a beautiful wife, characterized by the one that brings the joy in the home. The other thing that the the vine is characteristic of, the vine is weak. It's a weak um, tree. That's why I know in, in Egypt they used to do this. They put some little structure by wood to let the branches of the of the vine go on. Otherwise it cannot stand on its own. And let's always remember that the wife is the weaker vessel. As the Apostle Peter says, 
it's not weaker that uh, he is uh, strong and she is weak. But uh, he is weak and she is weaker. And they need support. They would love to get the support from their husband. And uh, this is one of the characteristics of the vine. The other thing when we talk about the vine, it reminds us of John 15. Beautiful chapter. I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. And what did he say? He said, abide in me and I in you. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself. So when you picture the wife as the vine, as a branch, all she does is that she abides in the vine in order to bear this fruit which would spread on the entire family because he says it is a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Just picture this literally. If there's a vine in the house and it branches off in every direction and it is bearing the fruit, how would a wife bear fruit? How would a husband? It is only by abiding in the Lord. He said something, without me, you cannot do much. Is that what he said? You could do nothing. Absolutely nothing. But only when we abide in him. You know, you could know all the lessons of what you as a wife could do. You can read them for yourself. What What the husband can do. And you repeat them. You memorize them. Most of us have memorized these. But unless we abide in him, unless his word abides in us, we are worth next to nothing. He is the one that does the work. Most of us love these words in Proverbs 31, the virtuous woman. She's a thrifty woman. She seizes every opportunity to make good of her family. Of her, of her children, of her husband. But at, towards the end, he says a beautiful thing. He says, um, beauty is vain. And, um, let me just read the verse that I do not misquote it. It's in Proverbs 31. And uh, verse 30, favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. This is a secret in, in the life of the virtuous woman, that she fears the Lord. And she does all that she does. She does marvelous things. And I wish that all women would do like this. Very diligent. She wakes up early in the morning. And I'm not trying to rebuke anybody. But uh, when the scripture says about this virtuous woman, this is the secret, is that she fears the Lord. She's worse. And then he says um, about rubies. She's more precious than rubies. Her her husband (coughs) is known in the city is known by what? Is known by being her husband. It's a praise to this wonderful woman. Her home is never lacking. But it is always because because of her relationship with the Lord. And we would like to stress this. In all the study that we're going to have, it is a personal relationship with the Lord. It is fearing the Lord. Now when we talk about the home, the home consists of a man. A man that fears the Lord, that obeys him. And uh, we would like to also stress the fact that he's a man. Therefore let the man leave his father and mother and cleave 
to his wife. He didn't say a young man. He has to be a man. A man of responsibility. Marriage is a serious business. It's not fun. You ask a young man, why do you want to get married? And you get many, many answers, you know. She would satisfy my desires. I would have some good time. I have someone to love. But uh, that is not the reason why a man should get married. A husband and wife are going to serve the Lord together, are going to fulfill the purpose of the Lord in their hearts, in their lives. If that is the ob objective, then happiness is the result. But if the objective is to be happy, is to get out of home, because I don't like to be in, uh, confined with my um, father and mother, I like to get some liberty, then that is not a reason. Or <clears throat> if I have reached a, an, an age you know, all my friends have got married. It's time for me to get married. That is not a purpose. But a man has to be mature. When God gave Adam a wife, he first gave him a job that he would tilt the ground. And secondly, he gave him a commandment. He was someone under responsibility that he can carry the responsibility of his family, of a wife and a children. It also consists of a woman, a woman that has similar characteristics, the woman that fears the Lord and is a desirous to serve the Lord. And that way, both of them, as the smallest unit in the world to serve the Lord, to be a testimony to the Lord. You know that the family is the unit, as Brother Siti mentioned, is the unit upon it the society is formed. It's formed of many families. And if we read the book of Genesis, it's a book of families. Before God dealt with a nation that starts in Exodus, he dealt with families. I'm going to look at these beautiful families, Noah and uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. You find them in the scriptures one after the other. And the Lord is showing us in his word what a family should be. I just want to Say again, if the family is founded on the Lord, then whatever comes in the way of the family, the Lord is going to be the one that supports the house in difficulties. And difficulties are definitely are going to arise in the, in the family. Whether it be difficulties between one another and Brother Siti when he prayed, he said that the family is the target of the enemy. He targets the families to turn husband against wife and children against parents. He did not tempt Adam before Eve was there. I mean, the devil. That's not mine, is it? Sorry. But he, he got his target when the husband and wife were together. After Eve was, was formed, then he gets his way and divides Adam and Eve. And Adam, who once said, she is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And a man shall leave his father and mother cleave to his wife immediately after the fall. He turns to the Lord and he says, The woman whom thou hast given me, she gave me. He, he just divided Adam from Eve right away. And this is what he's trying to do. 
he tries to divide the family and unknowingly if we are not watchful and careful we find one another against each other but who would sustain the family it's only the lord you know the um, the writer of the hymn it is well when when he is subject it is well with my soul when he is subject to all kinds of attacks and difficulties when the storm comes he could say in the middle of the storm it is well with my soul because the lord is in it when peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou hast me to say it is well it is well with my soul it is a beautiful words it is well with my soul when the rain falls when the storm blows and when the wind blows it must be well with our souls because the lord is in the house he's the foundation what time should we see and i hope we just move a little bit faster because we in general we're going to talk about marriage marriage and we take it from the origin when uh, the jews came to the lord in matthew 19 and they asked him the question uh should the man put away his wife for every reason and actually i'm told that for every reason means for every reason they used to do it for every reason not for being unfaithful they they tell me as i read books the the jews used to do this when she doesn't cook a good meal or when he gets in at home and the and the, the dinner is not ready that was a reason for him and they say can a man divorce um put away his wife for every reason and the lord didn't say no he didn't say yes of course it's a no but he takes them back to the original when they were in the garden and god created man and a woman he created them a man and a woman and then he repeats or he quotes that verse that the man would leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and you know this word cleave in the arabic language is very clear yaltasaq means to be glued right and it doesn't mean that uh, everywhere he goes she has to be with him he takes her to work and everything but it means unity it means no separation and know that word divorce that doesn't come in play in the in the family unless of course the lord gave the reason and uh, by that reason the marriage is broken already for the case of adultery but in any other case there is no such a thing as a separation and therefore he took them back to the original in the garden of eden and if we read those verses it shows us the unity between the husband and wife in uh, in chapter 1 right from the beginning when god created adam in verse 27 of chapter 1 of genesis so god created man in his own image in the image of god created he him male and female created he them and then in chapter 5 verse 1 This is the book of the generation of Adam. In the day that God created man in the likeness of God made he him male and female created he them 
and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. It's strange. He called their name Adam. And when you, when you go to the creation in the sixth day, God created Adam. And then later, <clears throat> later on, he put a deep sleep on him. And from one of his ribs, <clears throat> he made Eve. But in the very beginning, you could see the unity that Eve was created in Adam. He created them and he called their name Adam. They, they both are one. They are not twain, but one. The Lord says in Matthew 19. And you know when he says in Ephesians 5, when he says, husband, love your wives, and then he says, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. Because they're both one. She is him. They are both one person. So this is how God has created them. <clears throat> and this is how marriage <clears throat> is an honorable, I think uh, Brother Said mentioned this in the beginning, it's an honorable estate. It was performed by God in the Garden of Eden. In any marriage, there is someone that performs the marriage. And then he writes, records it, registers it in a book, in science. And when God performed the first marriage, he wrote it in a book, in the scriptures, and he put his seal on it. And therefore, that whom God put together, let no man put asunder. And in the vows, they say, or else death would put us apart. Is that what it says? Or, or death would... So there is nothing that would separate a husband and wife. They are one unit. They are one unity until death puts us apart. We said that marriage requires a mature person. It requires also faithfulness. It requires commitment. It requires sacrifice. You know, husband and, and wife, they should sacrifice for, for one another. Christian life is not cheap. Someone said to serve the Lord is expensive. It has to cost you something. And husband and wife ought to sacrifice for one another. They ought to seek one another's um, welfare. I just read a verse in Romans 15. And you know all these principles would be beautifully applied in the home. That we do not please ourselves. Romans 15 and verse 2. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification, for even Christ. Please not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. It has to have sacrifice, and each one has to do his best or her best to please the other. Just think of a, of a husband and wife, and they suppose the husband works. And he is uh, a doctor. He spends all his day dealing with patients, and uh, dealing with people is not an easy thing. And after a long day, he comes home, and he's ready to rest. Home, sweet home. It is the place where he is going to find his rest finally. And then perhaps the mother is at home with three or four children. <clears throat> she has to look after them. Some of them need changing. They need food. Maybe she took one to the doctor. And she is very tired. And when the husband comes in, she is ready to hand him the four children. What would happen? They're both right. The husband 
Well, I'm tired and working all day, and it's time for me to rest. And then she says, I've been looking after those four kids, carrying them. It's a lot of physical and mental strain, and I'm ready to hand them over to you. And what happens? I think this verse comes a very handy, very appropriate, that no one please himself. And let us take the Lord as an example. In all our studies, in all our life, he pleased not himself. But he says, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell upon me. You know, if we take the Lord as an example, it's a perfect example. And when the wife has been asked to submit to her husband, immediately he says, as unto the Lord. If you submit to the Lord, you could submit to your husband. And we would see why. And if you love the Lord, you would love your wife. Now we would like to ask a question, how to get married. You know, I was reading a book. It was an Arabic book, a little booklet. And the book was entitled, How Can I Get Married? And then my wife looked at me, what are you reading this book for? I said, no, this is not for me. (laughs) I've done it uh, 39 years ago, and I thank the Lord for it. But how to get married? If you're contemplating marriage, how to get married? Some just move from one conference to the other looking for a wife. And I'm not against going to conferences, but let this not be your purpose of going to Christian conference. And, uh, or uh, some speak to others, find me a, a wife. Or uh, whom should I ma- get married to? The first thing to do, of course, is prayer. And uh, ask the Lord to send you the one whom he has chosen for you. You know, he has one only for you. You say, I have to marry a Christian wife, but not every Christian wife. He has one for you, and he has one husband for you. You know the man, um, the servant of Abraham, when he was commissioned to go get a wife for his master's son, for Isaac. And he gave a sign. He sat on the well and he said, the the woman or the girl that comes first and I tell her, give me to drink. And she says, "I'll, I'll give you to drink and I will water your camels. She is the one whom thou hast appointed to thy servant Isaac. So he says that God has appointed one to Isaac. And it is not, God didn't send him ten and uh, ask him to choose the best one. I mean, uh, Rebecca was a beautiful woman, it says, her countenance. And she was a virgin. And I think that speaks not only of physical form, but she is the one that kept her love, kept herself, her affections to the one whom she is going to marry. And it's a beautiful characteristic for girls and boys, boys, men, is to keep your affections, keep yourself for the one whom the Lord is going to give you to marry. Christians have control over themselves. You can't let your affections flow to every girl or to any man. No, you have to keep that for the one whom the Lord would give you to marry. So the first thing to do is to be in prayer. And then the second thing, of course, is to wait on the Lord. There's a great reward on waiting on the Lord. Those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk 
and um, and not be tired. I'm just paraphrasing it. And then the Lord in Psalm 27, he says, Wait on the Lord and let your heart be strengthened. Wait, I say, on the Lord. It's a difficult task. Many times we jump the gun, as they say, and we take decisions and we want the Lord to approve them. But we wait on the Lord. The Lord brought Eve to Adam. He didn't bring him many and ask Adam to choose. It's a one man to a one woman. And then ask yourself why I want to get married. We mentioned before that there is a purpose that you must have. It has to be a noble purpose that uh, you would have. And then ask yourself, am I ready? Am I ready for marriage? Am I ready to carry the responsibility of a wife or a husband. And then what am I looking for in my partner? Beautiful girl, handsome man, sportsman, one that has a job. These are all nice. These are all nice. But like we said, if he is not a man that is faithful to the Lord, All these dreams that you have in your mind might collapse shortly after you get married. But unless the Lord builds the house, they shall labor in vain. Let the one that you want to choose is the one that God has chosen for you, but a one who honors the Lord. A one that is going to support you and uh, she is going to support you to live for the Lord together. One that would have the same kind of thinking. Hmm? It would be difficult to have a Christian woman, a Christian man, and we all think differently. We have different principles, different understanding of the scriptures. Now, we're not all alike, and we're not all conformed to one another. There is diversity and unity. So, a one would have the same tendencies and thinking. And then we must marry in the Lord. That's a verse, 1 Corinthians 7. He says about a woman that her husband died. If she wants to marry, let her marry. But only in the Lord. What does that mean? The one that the Lord has chosen for her. She has to marry a one that honors the Lord, the one that has the Lordship of Christ over him. I think we... Is that time now? So this is marriage in general. And now we would like to move to every individual in the family. And we begin with wives. There are many portions in the scriptures that speak about husband and wife. Ephesians 5, 1 Peter 3, Colossians, Timothy, and many of them that give clear instructions of a man and woman who are married. And we would also begin with 1 Corinthians 11, which gives God's order in the family and in the assembly. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of, a, of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. This is the headship and the order of God in the creation and in a very specific way in a Christian family and in the assembly. So he says that the head of every man is Christ. And what does the headship imply? It implies nourishment, guidance, leadership, uh, care, 
and love. But we have to remember always that neither the head can live without the body or the body can live without the head. And uh, we also have to remember that this is God's order in relationship with one another. But when it comes to the new man in Christ, neither the woman is less than the man or the man is less than the woman. In Christ, being a Christian, being a saved person on the way to heaven, in a new man, there is neither one uh, less than the other one. But if we look at the the role of the woman, he says, be, ch- be subject to your own husbands. And let us look at Ephesians in chapter 5. We're not going to talk about men, but all what it says about women, about the wives. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. As the one is submit, submitted to the Lord, and within the Lordship of Christ, the wife would be submitting to her husband. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. It is the happy lot of the wife to be subject to the leadership and guidance of the husband. And it also is her happy lot if she gives him the opportunity and the means to lead in the family and to lead in her in in their life as husband and wife. He cannot lead unless the the rest of the family, his wife and the children, are ones that are to be led. So he says, submit yourselves. And the word submit is different from obey. You know, when he says to the children, children, obey your parents in the Lord. And they say, which is very true, that submission is of one's own will. She is the one that has chosen at one time that she would marry this man. And by this, she is to submit unto him. A child has no choice. A child is born in the family and is placed there by God to obey his parents. And uh, not only this, but obedience has to do with commands. But the relationship between husband and wife is not commands. It's not dictatorship. I remember Dr. Patterson, we were at Grove City, and we were talking about the family. And he said the relationship of a wife to my wife to me If I'm traveling, I could call a taxi and tell him, at five o'clock you be at my home and you would take me straight to the airport and I want this and that and the other. And he, he gives his instructions to the taxi man. But if my wife is taking me, we sit down and talk. What time do you want to take me? What is convenient to you? And it's not an instruction as such, it's not a commandment, but it's a willful submission to the husband as a helper, as a helpmeet. And when uh, God created or made Eve, he made her as a helpmeet. Again, when he gave him Eve, and I... I say this to those that are again contemplating marriage. It was not dependent on how smart Adam was. When he named all the animals, he was very intelligent. He named the elephant, elephant, and the lion, lion. How did he get all this intelligence? It was a great big mind. But when he gave him Eve, he put him to sleep. A deep sleep, it says. It has nothing to do with your strength, with your power. It is God's gift to you. 
and it, it has to be appreciated by man. So the wife is to submit to her own husband, and I'm going to mention these reasons. Why should she submit? First, the first reason, it is the order of the family made by God. God who has created us, who had placed us in this world, it is his order that he, the man, is the head of the wife. Secondly, submission to him is submission to the Lord. In Colossians, he says, as it is fit in the Lord. It's the proper thing to do. It is fit in the Lord. And then in Peter, he says, even if those do not obey the word, they could be won by the conversation of the wife without words. Let's just look at this. It is vital in the life of the wife. In First Peter 3, he is speaking about a family that consists of a believing wife and an unbelieving husband. He is assuming, perhaps, that both were not believers at one time, and the wife believed on the Lord. What she should do? Look down on her husband? Well, I believe. You don't. Disobey or, or not submissive to the, her husband because he's not a believer? He says no. He says, um, verse 1, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the word, they also may without words be won by the conversation of the wives, by her manner of life. You know, the Apostle Peter stresses on this word in his epistle, conversation, manner of life. It is repeated maybe five or six times. And this is what counts in the Christian life. Our manner of life, not just how much we learned, but the husband would be one by the manner of, of life of the wife because he sees in her he beholds her chaste conversation coupled with fear. He would wonder, where did she get this manner from? There is some secret behind this. She must be Christian. And this is a reason for submission. You know, if you are a believer and your husband isn't, it, uh, and you want for us to go to the meeting, and he comes back from the work and he's so tired and he wants to uh, have a dinner. He says, no, 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 I'm going to the meeting. You find your way. You get your own meal. You know, you don't appreciate the meetings, but I'm going to the meeting. He cannot be won by this way. But he says, submit yourselves even to the non-believing husband that you may win him. And this feud would be your best mission in life to win your husband to the Lord. And then adorning herself. He says the adorning is not the outward adorning, but it is the characteristic, the characteristic of what? A hidden man of the heart, which is not corruptible, and then he says, a meek and chaste. That is a characteristic that wins the heart, but it should be characteristic of the wife, not the outward adorning. You know, young girls, the outward adorning may attract the boys or men. But which kind of men would be attracted? by the outward warning. This is not the man that you'd like to marry if you're a, a serious Christian. But the inward adorning, the characteristic of a chaste and hidden man of the heart, this is what is going to have a, a serious Christian 
to uh, would like to get married to a serious wife. I just say this. You know, um, Caleb, Caleb was a great man of God. He was one of two that witnessed a good witness. The twelve spies, ten of them, came with an evil report, except Caleb and Joshua. When he wanted to find a husband for his daughter, Aksa, he says in the beginning of the book of Judges, whoever fights those Canaanites and gets the land, I will give him Aksa, my daughter to wife. In other words, the one who marries his daughter has to be a serious Christian. They were not Christians has to be a one who knows the fights of the Lord. He doesn't want any man to marry his daughter. And then his nephew went and fought, and then he gave him Aksa to wife. And any father would wish for his son, for his daughter, to marry a serious Christian, a one who would follow the Lord, not the outward adorning. He calls it, it would corrupt. You know that they were corrupt. Women are beautiful anyways. You don't need to beautify yourself outwardly, but inwardly. And then the other thing, that the word of God may not be evil spoken of. He says this in Titus, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. He says in, the, in, the, um, in this translation, but it, it's, it wouldn't be spoken evil of. When, when the wife is not submitted to the husband and others see, they say, what kind of Christians are you? Doesn't it say in your Bible that the wife submit yourself to your own husband? So in, in Titus 2 and uh, Titus 2, and the end of five or the to be discreet, chaste keepers of home, good, obedient at their to their husbands, that the word of God be not evil spoken of. It's a it's a great reason for a wife to submit. And then the last reason I put here, if all the family, husband and wife and children, are in proper order, he says that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. He says this about the servants. This verse is in Titus 2 verse verse 10, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. The doctrine is beautiful, but it is made more beautiful when it is seen in the life of a wife and a husband and children. We adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. May this be the portion of each one of us. I guess we're going to stop here. We're going to close in prayer. Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word. It's ever instructive to each one of us. It shows us the way. It exposes ourselves and shows us perhaps our errors, but at the same time is capable of leading us in the proper way that we might be men and women to honor and to glorify thy name. We thank thee again and we commit us unto thee. We thank thee for the refreshments provided. We ask thy blessing upon them as we ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.